My name is Michael Hicks. I'm the development director at the Noyo Center for Marine Science. Uh, we want to thank everyone for coming out tonight or showing up online, um, wherever you are tuning in from. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here and for all those who are already supporters of the Noyo Center. Uh, but we do ask folks if they have the ability to uh, make an additional um, uh, gift um, to help us in supporting these talks from organizing the speakers to everything we do around these. We're really excited to be able to always provide these to people. So um, if you'd like to do that, I'm going to put a link to our donation page. And I am now going to uh, turn it over to uh, Sarah Grimes, my colleague at the Noyo Center for Marine Science. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Scott and Tree Mercer live in Point Arena in the south coast there. They're our neighbors. We welcome them to joining us this evening. If you want to read the impressive bio, you can do so on our website. I won't take up the whole time by reading it, but Scott has done and Tree have done a great deal of work around the ocean and the animals that live there, and they bring us a great deal more information and and good stuff. So enough from me. Thank you for being here and uh, take it away, Scott. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike and uh, Sarah. And thank all of you for tuning in, and especially those of you who have donated to keep um, Noyo afloat. And they do very valuable work that uh, we've been happy to help um, any any small way that we can. They, uh, Sarah's learned how to triplicate herself as things like uh, being three different places at once. And um, she does wonderful work with animals that are, are down and out or up on the beach. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about um, maybe. Next one. Next one. Yeah. Oh, not moving? No, it's musical, but oh. it's not moving. <laughs> Oh, then that we have okay. Huh. Alrighty, let's see here. Huh, what happened? <laughs> I can't move it. We'll get it. Um escape it. Oh jeez. Sorry. Give me a little time. Yeah, uh, take your time. It seems that the gremlins of all things uh PowerPoint follow me yeah. anyway. I can't seem to get them off the shoulder, but take your time. Um, sometimes the advance arrows work. And then when you do your screen large, sometimes you can't see down in that corner. Oh, well, right, right. That corner, there is the advance. You okay. got it. You got, got it. it. We'll use that instead. Okay. Let me move this. We're going to have to use this right here on the screen, huh? Okay. <laughs> no, this no, this and just touch it here. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Uh, this uh, work is a uh, talk is going to be based on work of um, Ralph Chami, who is works for the uh, he's an assistant director at the International Monetary Fund, and we were really honored to have Ralph as a speaker at um, one of the I guess it was the third in uh, Ocean Life Symposium. Uh, Sarah's been a, a speaker at two of them, two of ours so far, and um, Ralph uh, spoke from Washington D.C from the International Monetary Fund about the work he has done. And they have worked out, uh, his group has worked out things like the value of a whale uh, to the environment, value of uh, elephants, which we've just, uh, I got a manuscript of Ralph's today called The Secret Work of Elephants, which is pretty fascinating. And um, we're already trying to figure out how to work that into another PowerPoint. And uh, so uh, he's, they're working on strategies to protect whales and how they can limit greenhouse gases and global warming. And Tree and I just did a talk um, that uh, Michael and I were just talking about uh, a few weeks ago at the at the Point Arena Lighthouse on kelp ecology and the work of uh, sea otters, which we hope to get back up in this up in this area again, um, since they were hunted out in the early 1900s and before that. And have not come back uh, for obvious, for a number of reasons. And with them, the kelp beds have not come back either. And there's quite a few uh, pieces that go into that puzzle to bring sea otters before sea otters can be um, reintroduced up here. Um, but when they come, lots of good things come with them. I think so. Try it, but I think 
No, so um, you have to use the stem here. All right. Yeah. Okay, whales accumulate carbon in their bodies during their long lives. When they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean. Each great whale, these are the larger whales, finbacks, blue whales, and so forth, um, sequester 33 tons of carbon dioxide on average, taking that carbon out of the atmosphere for centuries. Uh, Ralph's group estimated um, a couple of years ago that a tree, a large tree, full grown, meanwhile absorbs only up to about 48 pounds of carbon dioxide a year. You can see a, a large whale and during its lifetime sequesters much more than that. Just hit the... mm -hmm. oh. um, research shows that this is something that Ralph kind of floored us with is that uh, one, one whale is worth about 1,500 trees when it comes to sucking in carbon out of the atmosphere and sequestering it in the, in the, the body of themselves in the form of wood or lumber. Whales' waste products contain exactly the substances, notably iron and nitrogen, that phytoplankton need to grow. Phytoplankton produce at least 50% of the oxygen in our atmosphere. For those of you who will talk a little bit more about this uh, this evening, but um, for those of you not familiar with these terms, phyto uh, loosely means plant. Uh, the animal, the so-called plants in the ocean are not plants, but for all measure for um, terms of conversation, we'll just we'll refer to seaweeds and so forth, uh, which are not weeds, but refer to them as, as the plants of the ocean. They produce at least 50% of the oxygen in our atmosphere. So the term um, every other breath is um, a reference to the phytoplankton in the oceans that produce 50% of the oxygen on Earth. Oh, it's still coming. A conservative estimates put the value of the average great whale based on its various activities at more than $2 million and easily over $1 trillion for the current stock of great whales. Now, um, the various activities of whales <clears throat> being that much money, <laughs> they are um, not singing in nightclubs or anything, but they're... <clears throat> uh, you better just come up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I will go on. Here we go. Uh, this graphic shows uh, how much a whale is worth based on the fishing industry, estimates that over $150 billion comes in because of whales contributing to the food web. Uh, it increases the stock of fish. Whale watching as an industry is estimated at over $2 billion globally. People want to get out there and look at whales. Each whale sequesters, this was said previously, 33 tons of carbon dioxide on average. And when it dies, the, the, the whale's body sinks to the ocean floor. And it, 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 it's a host to so many other organisms. And of course, the photoplankton productivity is enhanced by whales throughout. Good. Okay. A little, little video now for you. How whales change climate. There's dance music with it. <laughs> Exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. We all know that whales eat fish and krill, and some people, certain politicians in Japan, for instance, have argued that killing whales is good for human beings, as it boosts the food available for us to eat. And so you would think. But as the great whales declined, so did the numbers of fish and krill. It, it seems counterintuitive. Surely their numbers would rise as their major predators disappeared. But it now turns out that whales not only eat these animals, they also 
keep them alive. In fact, they help to sustain the entire living system of the ocean. Whales feed at depth in waters that are often pitch dark, and then they return to the surface to the photic zone, where there's enough light for photosynthesis to happen. There they release what biologists call fecal plumes, vast outpourings of poo, poonamis. These plumes are rich in iron and nitrogen, nutrients which are often very scarce in the surface waters. And these nutrients fertilize the plant plankton that lives in the only place where plants can survive, the photic zone. Fertilizing the surface waters isn't the only thing the whales do. By plunging up and down through the water column, they also keep kicking the plankton back up into the photic zone, giving it more time to reproduce before it sinks into the abyss. Even today, the whale populations have been greatly reduced. The vertical mixing of water caused by movements of animals up and down through the column of the oceans is astonishingly roughly the same as the amount of mixing caused by all the world's wind and waves and tides. More plant plankton means more animal plankton on which the larger creatures then feed. In other words, more whales means more fish and krill. But the story doesn't end here because plant plankton not only feeds the animals of the sea, it also absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. When eventually it sinks to the ocean floor, it takes this carbon out of circulation down to a place where it remains for thousands of years. The more whales there are, the more plankton there is. The more plankton there is, the more carbon is drawn out of the air. When whales were at their historical populations, before great numbers of them were killed, it seems that they might have been responsible for removing tens of millions of tons of carbon from the atmosphere every year. Whales change the climate. The return of the great whales, if they're allowed to recover, could be seen as a benign form of geoengineering. It could undo some of the damage we've done, both to the living systems of the sea and to the atmosphere. Okay, as you can see, whales are real engineers of the uh, their, the environment and have a huge effect on uh, the environment, the immediate environment that they are in. Um, you're going to have to read this yourselves. I can't see the whole thing here. It's okay. Just explain this. Okay, well, this is um, be explained to the right of the photo of the, big, of the um, graphic here. Um, we have carbon dioxide in the environment, which we know phytoplankton uh, takes up um, the carbon, just like grass in your yard and plants do and trees do, and give off oxygen. And as far as the ocean air goes, you have physical mixing through whale through uh, action of whales in the in the ocean by moving their tails up and down, traveling, also upwelling and currents and waves breaking uh, create a lot of mixing of oxygen. Uh, the atmos atmospheric gases and the uh, uh, the, the um, composition of the ocean itself. Uh, zooplankton, or zooplankton is um, these are the animal planktons, um, which we'll get to here in a few minutes. Um, phytoplankton are the uh, the ones that photosynthesize. They're they're very tiny. They're um, diatoms and so forth, and quite small, and 
they each have uh, some chlorophyll in them so they can photosynthesize. And even better than that, each, uh, each cell of phytoplankton has a teeny, teeny bit of oil in it. And why would they need oil? You know, oil floats. And to photosynthesize, you want to stay up top. So um, phytoplankton has a teeny bit of oil in there with the chlorophyll so that it can photosynthesize and um, give us that oxygen that we need. Uh, zooplankton are the animal, uh, the animal plankton members, and they graze like a rabbit grazes or gophers, um, deer and so forth. They graze on the phytoplankton. So they uh, then ingest um, each cell of phytoplankton that they feed on, which um, they graze on, which also means they take in the uh, that teeny drop of oil I was talking about, and um, they load up. And oil, as you know, is full of calories, and um, they load up on uh, that oil from the phytoplankton themselves. It makes them extremely nutritious for animals that feed on zooplankton. And uh, there are other zooplankton that are bigger than the smaller ones, like krill, for example. So they load up on that on this, these oily, zo uh, smaller zooplanktons. When a whale comes along, um, then they get uh, a large mouthful of calories. And um, I'll wait a little bit here. So. Um, you have the respiration from the zooplankton because they are uh, animals and members of the animal plankton. And so they're, they're, they're respiring, they are exhaling uh, or giving off carbon dioxide and um, also excretions. And uh, so let's see, what else is here? Okay, where is this? Which one is this? Okay, uh, examples of phytoplankton. Okay, again, the word phyto loosely translates to plant, and the plankton is uh, from the Greek for drifters. And um, we tried to, uh, it, a recent uh, talk we gave, um, I thought that had a certain poetic charm to it, the plant and plank, the, the drifters. And uh, um, mentioning that in terms of some of the California poets, I mentioned a few and it kind of fell flat on its face <laughs> at the time. So um, so this is the um, patches of phytoplankton over here, which bloom because of the photosynthesizing. And also if you're out around the ocean on a sunny day and it's fairly flat, we don't have a lot of whitecaps mixing things up, you'll see um, large patches of green in the ocean. And that's, uh, that's the uh, phytoplankton blooming. And around that, you'll often see seabirds that uh, like the oily bits of the uh, phytoplankton themselves and will swoop down to pick that up. And okay. Okay, um, this is a, a, a shot taken under the ice in the Arctic, uh, what ice is left there. And um, you can see the algae growing on the bottom of that. Now, that's extremely important to the survival of our, our gray whales uh, and hundreds of other species. But um, this is a millions-year-old um, food web that is coming apart very quickly because of uh, climate change and the warming waters. But that's algae growing on the bottom of, the, of an ice sheet. And that, um, that does photosynthesize, and uh, recent work up there has shown that it's able to photosynthesize through um, through the ice sheet and continue growing. So it's extremely important as a food source. Um, that will break off, regrow, and as it breaks off, it drifts down to the bottom. And on the way down, it gets fed on by uh, mid-level consumers. When it gets down to the bottom, it breaks up, and animals living down in the substrate will graze on that as well, and that's um, those of us working with gray whales, that's extremely important to the um, invertebrates that live in the bottom. They feed on those bits of algae coming down. And without the ice, you're not going to have that algae you see there. And without that, you don't have the food source for really hundreds of other species from microscopic right on down to feeding gray whales. <laughs> I have to beat it. <laughs>
Okay, this is a, a photo of the one-celled uh, diatoms that uh, make up the plant plankton. And remember, each one of these has chlorophyll, even though it doesn't look green here. And they um, each have that teeny tiny bit of oil in there so they can stay afloat. Okay, um, these are some examples of uh, the animal plankton. These are the guys that are at the mercy of, um, these are more of the drifters. These are uh, at the mercy of currents and tides. And only, they are a bit mobile. If you ever have them under a, on a slide, you can see them moving around. But in the ocean, they're at the mercy of uh, currents, tides, and upwelling and so forth. Um, let's see, the one you might be most familiar with, and I won't do this tonight, but in other talks, I've um, copepod is fairly famous. Um, I've asked for a show of hands of how many people are familiar with SpongeBob SquarePants, and usually maybe two or three brave people will raise their hands, but otherwise uh, that falls flat too. But um, let's see, copepods are uh, extremely important in the marine food chain. Just about everybody eats them uh, from other zooplankton, you know, krill feeds on them, uh, birds feed on them, uh, seals, sea lions, um, just about everybody. Um, whales certainly do. I've seen uh, finback whales sliding on big uh, swarms of these copepods before. So um, they're not safe from anybody. And okay, one thing I'd like you to notice right there is that little one, that red eye spot on a copepod, and there's a little mass of them over here to the left. Um, you can make out that tiny little red spot there. And these are about the size of a um, grain of rice. Okay, okay and this SpongeBob SquarePants, I spent hours watching him uh, with my son when he was quite a bit younger than he is now. And Sheldon there is a, is a copepod. Um, you can see the red eye spot. I can go back. There's that red eye spot right there. And then back to Sheldon. So he's pretty accurate. Um, and this actually show was actually, um, from what I heard, was um, the brainchild of some marine biology majors at Humboldt, at uh, UC at Humboldt. Um, it's Cal State Humboldt mm -hmm. or UC now. But anyway, uh, this SpongeBob there. And um, um, this produced quite a few stars, not just Sheldon, but there was Squidward and um, Patrick, yeah, uh, Patrick, um, who's SpongeBob's best friend, but I want to ask for a show of hands here. So, okay, and here's some actual krill. Krill does feed on copepods, one of the things that eats copepods. And this is a photo by our friend and neighbor right down the street here from us, Doug Forsell, uh, who Sarah knows well. And um, he's retired. Um, uh, well, bird, I was a bird biologist. He's actually a um, bird migration specialist, and uh, I worked for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for about forty-five years. But you got this photo on. Um, I'm not sure which beach here, but um, a few years ago, Manchester. This is uh, this is what krill looks like, and um, if you're from Maine, that's about the size of the Maine shrimp that we used to be able to get until that. Um, that industry is kind of falling apart too, also because of warming waters. Be careful of that water. The um, so that's what the krill looks like when you hear about krill and whales feeding on krill. It's, it's a couple inches long at the most, and um, it's quite edible if you <laughs> if you want to uh, pick some up sometime. Yep. And here's what it looks like when it's all together and in the ocean, and that's the type of swarm that um, whales would like to engulf, come at and engulf. And who knows how many millions in there, but these would feed on, feed on copepod, which grazes on the phytoplankton. So you get that part of the food chain there. And then if a marine mammal comes along or even um, small sharks will feed on, will circle these and, and um, dive, dive, I guess, dive into them and feed on these as well. Okay, this is um, 
the atmospheric CO2 pump. Um, we've shown this in other talks, and it's pretty graphic about how CO2 is building up in, in our um, atmosphere. Uh, one thing that um, to watch over here is the right to the right hand side um, below that um, graphic. Uh, you'll see um, it says Mauna Loa. There's a Mauna Loa observatory there, which is um, which has uh, monitored the buildup of CO2 in the in the environment for a number of years, and um, 1989 was the last time they saw a concentration of about 350 parts per million in the in the atmosphere. Next, Next one. Yes. <laughs> And the years here will tick away in front of you, 1982. And then you'll be able to watch on the, the lower line of the graph there, the numbers. This is where the Mauna Loa Observatory will, their readings will click in. So in 1979, we had 336 parts per million of carbon in carbon dioxide in our, in, in our atmosphere. They were breathing, and you can see it going up year by year to 1997 now. And this hasn't quite updated yet to um, this year, but I believe now we're at um, what I just read, we're about 422 parts per million. This is Mauna Loa. In 1989 was the last time they saw 350 parts per million. And the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, as most of you know, is responsible for the heating we have in the atmosphere and also the heating of the oceans. So there's 400 parts per million we're just about at now. And with um, that was a goal not to go above 400 a few years ago, but see, we're well above that now. I just said, I, I believe four, uh, 421 is where we are now, 422. Mm -hmm. So in January, 2022, uh, four, we're at 418 parts per million. And this will give you some other reference points here as we go up. Before the Industrial Revolution, we were at 278. And as you know now, we put a lot of soot into the uh, atmosphere at that time. And that's where that famous study was done with moths camouflaging themselves against the darker trees. In 1958, we were at 316 parts per million. Now, Today we're at uh, 421. Uh, so as I said, I was, in the ice age, we were about 185 parts per million. So we're now up to 418, and and we just had the hottest year on record. Again, it seems like every year we hear that. So, so this is readily available off of YouTube, and I'm so, sorry they haven't updated it yet, but um, they did last year. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a good teaching tool for so people can see um, how this builds up. Okay, then the whale pump. Now uh, we'll read these. Um, the first one is when whales at depth feeding. And uh, next one, whales come to the surface to breathe. Um, when they come to the surface, they do these gigantic poops. Uh, through photosynthesis, uh, phytoplankton absorbs nearly a third of human generated carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, let's see, five there is phytoplankton, provides every other breath you intake, and the whale pump process creates a thriving ocean habitat. Okay, and um, those of you who have been around whales when they do poop, which is often when you're out around them for several hours a day, they eat a lot. And um, this whale does not have hemorrhoids. <laughs> um, when you work on a whale watch boat, um, and things like this happen, you get this, you get the strangest questions. But um, this is actually what happens when whales uh, eat a lot of krill or sh more shrimp-like organisms. They actually poop red. And as I said, it does create a lot of questions from people on board. Um, but these poops are quite large and very easy to collect because they are, do cover such a large area. And the whale up here in an ice sheet um, area. Behind it is the, um, the brown plume. The whale defecates. And these are dolphins um, 
pooping in the water. Uh, those are the solids or clumps that are easier to collect. And if you ever do this, um, if it hasn't already happened to you. The first time I did that, um, we put the a uh, little bit of these clumps into um, a plastic uh, collecting bottle. And it wasn't long before the acid in that ate right through the uh, plastic bottle. So we didn't do that again. We used, a, used glass after that. But you can tell a lot from um, from that uh, waste, fecal waste. Uh, most importantly, how, um, for example, the, how stressed the, the animals are. And um, there's a famous study the New England Aquarium did on that after 9-11. Uh, I should just mention here quickly, um, New England Aquarium works with uh, North Atlantic right whales in the Bay of Fundy, where they used to, before climate change has warmed the Gulf of Maine so much, where uh, North Atlantic right whales uh, summered uh, for um, feeding on copepods. And um, the, uh, that, the, each day they collected whale poop to uh, measure the uh, stress hormones and um, other whatever else they could find in it. And after 9-11, when George Bush um, canceled shipping and overhead flights, uh, you know, shipping by flights too, um, everything became much quieter for a week or two. And during that time, they found that the stress hormones that they were collecting were very, very low, just dropped immediately when the shipping, when the shipping came to an end during that time, and also the, the uh, flights going overhead. And um, when he gave the okay for shipping to start again, the um, stress hormones went up the same day and stayed up, stayed up there high. So um, that's a, we hope that's a study that can't be replicated. And also um, it just shows um, what we're doing to the animals with noise in the ocean. And also, um, what you can find by studying this. I used to tell people, if you're interested in studying whales um, and you want to get into a field that's still uncrowded, um, whale fecal studies, are, that's your ticket. But I, actually now a lot of people are doing this and uh, getting a lot of valuable results out of it. This one. <laughs> um, and these are the ones that you would, these are the small uh, chunks that you would want to try to collect in, in sample bottles. The big thing too with some of these species is to see what they're eating. Um, little bits of scales or bone. And that type of work is being done now with the ricest whale, which has been discovered down in the Gulf of Mexico. And there are only about four dozen of those. And so everything is, um, everything about them is being studied. Okay, and as Tria said before, that you could do an entire um, PowerPoint on on these interactions. And there are, um, in a typical food web, um, people at UC Santa Cruz that were studying sea otters a couple of decades ago, as they said, um, you could get um, thousands, actually uncountable numbers of interactions in an active food web. But just simply here, um, these, these are um, the dangers to a whale, which is similar to a food web, which everything impacts eventually on the whale. Um, there's the nutritional stress, vessel strikes, water, the quality of, of water. They're, they're living in entanglements, ropes here, uh, debris, predation, and of course, noise, which you just mentioned there with the stress too. This one again. Yeah, we're going to focus on these three. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. uh, the big three with um, mortality to whales are entanglements, vessel strikes, and debris. Right now, this, um, if you walk along the beach uh, at low tide, you'll see how much debris washes up. Okay, and all right now. On the right-hand side there, it's just a graphic showing a whale being struck by um, a large container vessel. So these are increased shipping risks for whales and dolphins. And uh, let's see, between 1992 and about a 10-year period, 
uh, the volume of shipping traffic uh, worldwide has increased by uh, 300%. Uh, the busiest shipping lanes overlap with important whale habitats, and increasing ship traffic is more than doubling underwater noise pollution every decade, including in the Arctic, where noise pollution is increasing at a faster pace. Well, this is put out by the International um, well, the World, World Wildlife Fund. Everybody knows their, their panda. And it says our new, our new report highlights. Uh, they get credit for that. Uh, moving ships away from whales, slowing down major shipping in the lanes, uh, making ships quieter with noise reduction uh, technology in some of the new builds, which is, uh, they've been working for a number of years. Um, the people who make these large ships to try to quiet the uh, props down and just the engine noise that beams out into the ocean. And uh, one thing I want to mention is that um, nobody is trying to shut down shipping. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, a while back, um, someone was seeking us out and found us uh, while we were trying to get a count on humpback whales back in the fall. And he wanted to let us know that those binoculars around our neck came on came overseas on a on a on a cargo vessel, which you know we already knew. But um, uh, the idea is to slow the ships down, and it's been a voluntary um, uh, move by the shipping companies to voluntarily slow the speed down by coming into the Golden Gate, going by the Farallons. Everybody knows that's a uh, most people know that's a a um, very productive uh, feeding area for different habit, different species of whales. And Bill Keener has photographed humpback whales right under the, uh, he's the marine, at the Marine Mammal Center. Um, Bill has photographed humpback whales, you know, going in and out of the Golden Gate. And tragically, um, because of all the shipping traffic, there have been some strikes, but also gray whales are coming in there, which even more tragically, they may be looking for food on the way back to the Arctic. But um, the voluntary speed limits, um, unfortunately, we just recently found out from a, a study that was done of, in areas like uh, here and Boston, areas where whales are feeding right in shipping lanes, 80% of um, the ships are not abiding by the voluntary guidelines. Um, so that was, was kind of sad to find that out because we've been hoping that um, they would voluntarily, the shipping uh, companies would voluntarily um, have their ships slow down coming into ports, in and out of ports where, where there are whales. And in some of the areas, there are mothers and calves there, like in the Boston shipping lanes going in and out of there. That's summer feeding area on Stellwagen, Stellwagen National Marine Fisheries, and sorry, National Marine um, um, thank you. Sanctuary. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> You know, many humpbacks bring their calves right into that area, and a lot of ships going in and out of the shipping lanes there. So um, the idea is to is to voluntarily slow this down. And we also have right whales in that area, so we don't want to see. Uh, there's only 345 of them left, so we don't want to see any of them get hit. Okay, this is um, a graphic that we lifted out of the San Francisco Chronicle that was put together by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Now this is a graphic that's sped up, so don't get dizzy looking at it, but um, you, it's a, um, a, whale, a blue whale feeding in an area. This is a tagged blue whale that was tracked feeding in, a, in an area of active shipping. This one again. <laughs> That's the ships, and the blue one you see going through there is a blue whale trying to feed.
You see that? It's amazing that any whale can survive that. I'm going to do it again. Okay, as, um, as big as whales are, you know, we have ships now that are hundreds and hundreds of feet long. Our, our biggest whale is maybe a little over 100 feet. There's some records of blue whales being a little over 100 feet in length, but um, some of these big big ships are tremendously large. And if you look at the very top floor of that uh, cruiser going by, um, that's where they steer the boat from up top there. And that gives you a nice long look for the higher up you are. But um, how 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 big is a whale going to look if you're up there and you're 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 the you're the guy running this uh, ship? And this is what we don't want to see. This is what uh, sometimes is the result. Um, obviously, these people in the, these ships don't even know they hit a whale. A um, 70 or 80 or even 90 ton whale doesn't slow a boat down for a second. You can see they get hit on that big, big bulbous um, bow area. This is a, a dead finback whale that our friend um, and everybody in Noyo knows Elisa pretty well too. Um, <clears throat> Elisa Schulman Janiger was. She took this photo, and I believe it was um, down in um, Port, Port of Los Angeles. And this has happened in San Francisco and Oakland, too. There are photos in the local papers here over the last few years of ships coming into Oakland and San Francisco Bay um, with a dead whale over the bow. Another example of how large these are, the ships are. And this is a uh, young North Atlantic right whale, FWC there's Florida, Florida Wildlife Commission, I think it is. Um, anyway, it's a dead, uh, you can see the prop marks right down this uh, young, young right whale's back and it's being measured here. Um, the um, oh, the uh, North Atlantic right whales winter down in the um, off of Florida and Georgia, and there are all warnings the whole time down there about being careful. Um, if you're on a boat, there's a lot of sport fishing goes on in the winter down in Florida, and um, there have been a few, um, there have been several collisions each winter down there, and um, a calf was hit and killed. Well, well, more than one, two or three calves, newborn calves down there um, have been hit and killed by, by ship strikes. One was hit in the head last year, a calf that was just a, probably about a week old. The North Atlantic right whales have their calves down off of uh, Georgia and Florida during the wintertime. And then they summer up in the Bay of Fundy, or they used to, not anymore with the Gulf of Maine warming up so much, they're now heading up around Nova Scotia and up into Quebec, where a lot of uh, right, North Atlantic right whales were hit up there by crossing into the shipping lanes, the St. Lawrence shipping lanes off Quebec. This one. <laughs> okay. And uh, closer to home here, the, um, here's our coastline. The point arena up at the end there with the Greater Farallons Sanctuary boundaries are you can see the red this cordell bank is a very highly productive offshore fishing bank um point rays right where that um orb starts right there like bodega's in the wrong place <laughs> um let's see then down the coast toward monterey bay and monterey bay national marine sanctuary so um trying to you know there's tremendous boat traffic going shipping traffic going in and out of uh, san francisco and i mentioned they're trying to use the voluntary speed limits to uh, have the ship slow down to 10 knots uh, anything below that with uh, these bigger ships is uh, really hard for them to handle navigate and maneuver the ship around so 10 is actually quite slow and um I was talking about speed. When I first started whale watching in 1978, uh, I first started my business back east. The boats I used only went 10 knots, and the typical 
finback whale went 12 or 13. And there were whales that we never caught up to. They just went right off thumbing their nose at us. And, uh, you know, I think of that now and how, how appreciative people were even to see a whale at a distance. And as time went on with uh, more whales in the area and faster boats, um, how that, that changed after a while. Okay, and then whale alert, actually, um, Noyo mm -hmm. uh, had a, a um, science talk one night. And uh, so we, we got involved in this. And uh, one of the women who was there talking was actually from the Cape Cod area in Massachusetts. Now, <clears throat> how this works, a tree actually, yeah, a tree actually uses this mm -hmm. each day. Fortunately, we need it each day. Yeah, this is a, a simple app to add to your phone, and anyone can use it. I use it daily to report any whales that we see. Very easy to, to use, and I encourage everybody uh, you know, to participate and to download this app. It allows the user to report any live, dead, or a distressed whale to the appropriate response agency. So this is a very important tool for reducing ship strikes uh, as a threat to all different whale species. Uh, if, if I could use it on my iPhone 7, I'm sure that you can use it on the iPhones that, that you might have or, or, or other devices like that. I, I, I love it. I use it every day. Yeah, when we first um, were asked to um, get involved in this, I thought, well, Point Arena, there's a size limit to the boats there. They're small. Um, the size limit is somewhere around 30 feet, I think. And uh, everybody there, all the guys there, there um, are aware that there are whales right in that in that area. They leave Point Arena Cove and out in, to go crabbing or whatever, or fishing, salmon fishing. What are they going to do? They know there are whales out there. But um, we got using it and realized that we were. Um, sending signals out to boats that were many miles out. And it wasn't just the traffic in and out of uh, Point Arena. Like we've been very pleased with what, we, what we've seen from the um, folks going in and out of um, the uh, consideration that we've seen from boats going in and out of uh, Point Arena Cove over the years. <clears throat> and could you send things out to um, oh, uh, This works best if, you know, um, if someone in the boat uh, has the other end of this. Sure. So that a beeper or some warning goes off inside the uh, pilot house, a wheelhouse of the um, the vessels that we're sending this warning out to. Okay, this arrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and this is how, how this works. A different system, we'll see. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. the same kind of idea. This is mostly for the big ships going in and out of, um, and using the shipping lanes going in and out of major ports. And this is a little bit mixed up here, but um, number one is the intelligence buoy. It sends a signal to a satellite. The satellite sends a signal to an early warning station on the ground, and the ship receives a warning from the station. You have a uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's this one out here in the um, the water between two and three is actually it's like an island, but it's actually what, what they're referring to as the early early warning station on the ground. Um, then you have some of the whales that we typically find um, in places where it's endangered to be, and um, now this works best if um, the ship has a um, receiver. Now you see how this goes around out out of space back and so forth and it doesn't work if the ship doesn't have a receiver to um receive the message that there are whales in the area and um you know nighttime is especially dangerous for everybody well entanglement oh yeah moving now to another hazard the whale entanglements and this is a short video. It's a simulation of how um, um, whales get entangled once they 
what what they do behaviorally when they're underwater and they run into uh, nets or ropes. And this is all figured out by um, keeping the gear that whales get entangled in. Uh, when the rescuers go out, the disentangle teams go out, um, they like to save all the rope that they can to see um, what the whale did when it was entangled and how the rope is uh, strained or broken or um, most stretched from the whale, the whale struggling. So it's already really important that that gear doesn't go under, doesn't go back in the ocean just because the whale is freed, because then it becomes debris on the bottom, but lots of things to get entangled in. But it's also a real textbook uh, to the disentanglers back at shore to study it. No, I'm an I'm an over one. I guess I should go here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You have to be patient with this one. Entanglement in fishing ropes, in particular those used with pots and gill nets, is a major threat to large whales. Scarring from ropes on more than two-thirds of North Atlantic right whales illustrates how frequent these encounters are for this critically endangered species. Restricted mainly to the Northwest Atlantic, these whales have a global population estimated at only 450 individuals. The Consortium for Wildlife Bycatch Reduction is a group of scientists, fishermen, and engineers who have come together to find solutions to this threat. A major challenge we face in achieving our objective is that so little is known about the dynamics of encounters between whales and fishing gear. In the vast ocean, these encounters are rarely observed and never studied. So, with the help of Belquant Engineering, we are developing a virtual whale entanglement simulation model. The computer uses an anatomically precise rendering of a North Atlantic right whale and fishing ropes incorporating accurate engineering principles and properties. real-time user interaction with the computer modeling system through a game-style controller allows fishermen, marine mammal and conservation scientists, gear designers, and fisheries professionals to test various gear configurations and whale behavior what-if scenarios. The goal is to use this computer model to help us better understand how whale entanglements occur, how different gear interacts with whales, and allow mitigation strategies to be tested virtually. This virtual whale entanglement simulator represents a collaborative effort by marine mammal scientists, fishermen, fisheries professionals, and engineers to reduce severe entanglements of North Atlantic right whales. This is the worst case scenario right here. It's a whale that has been it's entirely wrapped up in what looks like gill netting. Um, but, um, see how this whale rolled and rolled and rolled, uh, obviously when it, when it hit the netting. And uh, then you end up with this uh, whale that's completely mummified in these uh, nets. And the problem is a whale like this may not, you see somebody up the top of the screen there, sorry, top of the screen there, a diver in the water, you know, um, evaluating what they need to do next. And um, um, these uh, whales can't get to the surface to breathe, then you have a, a dead whale. And um, that happens sometimes that they just can't get up to, if, they're, if they are tethered down the, to the um, gear on the bottom and all the weights, they can't even get up to the top to ex inhale and exhale. Okay, this, um, I know where this is. <laughs> this is um, in uh, Maine waters. Um, 
This is off of Bar Harbor, Maine, uh, in the Gulf of Maine. And I know that because it says it on the side of the boat, too, Maine Marine Patrol. But also that island you see out there, that's, um, I know that well, that's um, Mount Desert Rock, which is 20 miles off of Mount Desert Island, which is where Bar Harbor, Maine is. And uh, all of us who started in the 70s spent time out on that uh, rock, Mount Desert Rock. It sounds like Alcatraz, the rock. But you think you were on Alcatraz. I wish you were. Um, when Back in the 70s, the Coast Guard still ran that. And when uh, the few of us who were working with whales back then um, would spend nights out there with that foghorn blasting every every few seconds, um, then you knew you were on the rock. Uh, and we had a reunion a couple of years ago of all of us who were out there then working in the 70s and 80s, which is a lot of fun to see everybody. But that's Mount Desert Rock there, which College of the Atlantic in Maine now operates. They took it over from the Coast Guard a few years ago when the Coast Guard was giving up um, being in charge of all the lighthouses. And um, it's trained uh, hundreds and hundreds of people in marine science. Okay, um, this is a humpback whale. As you can see, the rope going across the hump there for the, before the dorsal fin. And uh, the disentangle here holding one of the um, knives on a long stick that he used to cut the ropes to free them up and um, then get the gear into the boat. So this is off of uh, the northern end of the Gulf of Maine. And uh, this is in Canada, Canadian waters. Um, this is uh, North Atlantic right whale here uh, caught up in here and um you know a couple of people on the boat here the small person there in the middle of the boat that's moira brown mo, mo brown um who now runs the canadian whale re uh, uh we have a sticker on the back of our car i can't remember the name of it mo's group there but this was a, a whale rescue canadian whale rescue boat uh coming out to um try to free this north atlantic right whale and um, you can see the, the big, what are called Gloucester balls, the um, mooring balls that we use to mark the net. And uh, now they're wrapped around the whale's body. And um, uh, for the family's privacy, a man here holding the, uh, the cutting um, equipment um, uh, was killed by a whale that uh, he had just freed. That's why we'd ask people to, you know, to not try to free whales themselves for a couple of reasons. He was a fisher, a Canadian fisherman who loved whales and hated to see them entangled. And he uh, um, spent his time uh, whenever he could uh, disentangling whales. And uh, he had just finished um, along with some New England aquarium personnel who were up in Canada disentangling uh, right whales um he was looking over the side of the boat to see why the whale hadn't moved yet because they had all the gear off of it the whale didn't realize it was free and when it did it took a steep dive throwing its flukes up and hit him so that was pretty sad at the time and we were all shocked by it but you have to be um really careful around these animals they don't know you're there to help them and they're they're terrified they're um traumatized and it's it's a it's not a, a good, an easy situation and a lot of the people um, say that they're most, they're most scared of right whales because as slow and tedious as they are, um, they react in a bad way when they're caught up. Oh, and this one here, this was terrible. This was, um, well, they're all terrible, but this is a North Atlantic right whale. And this now to the south end of the Gulf of Maine, this is off of Provincetown, right outside of Provincetown Harbor. And... Um, this is a this is a right whale that was photographed entangled off the coast of Quebec, Canada, far eastern Canada, you know, way above Tadoussac and Quebec City and all that, um, and was already entangled. And it wasn't disentangled before nightfall, and they lost the whale. They weren't able to get one of the uh, tags on it. And this whale showed up days later in Provincetown at the southern end of the Gulf of Maine. Um, it wasn't even in the Gulf of Maine when it was entangled. So that's outside of the Gulf of Maine. That's off. That's up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And this whale was entirely wrapped up in ropes. 
uh, said it showed up in Provincetown, you know, right outside of Provincetown in Cape Cod, and um, probably the best disentanglement team in the country came out to save it. And uh, those of you who are familiar with whales, you know that baleen doesn't stick out of the front of a whale's mouth. But uh, this whale had uh, crab gear on it um, from Quebec. And um, so it hadn't eaten in days. And it couldn't even open its mouth. And if you see, oh, you can't see my finger, but around the, the baleen, you can see a loop of rope. And um, I should point out some field marks here. These, the big thick white that you see on the top of the mouth, the top of the head, is are called callosities. They're thickened raised skin growth on every right whale. And every right whale has them in a different place on their body, on their heads, a different pattern. And by photographing um, a right whale's head, we humpback whales, you photograph their hind end when they lift their tail flukes. But with right whales, you photograph their head because those callosities are never in the same spot at the same time as on the same whale. Okay, coming out of here from the Coastal Studies, the Center for Coastal Studies, they were the first people to develop disentangling gear. And... Um, they now go around the world training other people. And they have um, people who, who started in Provincetown, now out in Maui, disentangling humpbacks that get entangled in Alaska before they winter over in uh, Maui. Um, so this, and they, they also developed the disentangling equipment. So you see the, the uh, pole that this disentangler is holding. And then on the end there, there's some sort of a knife blade that they've developed by going out and initially freeing whales um, in the Gulf of Maine, they realized what they needed and how to make them. And because uh, you, know, you can't go in a hardware store and say, I need a humpback wheel disentangle device. So they had to make their own based on their, their experience. And uh, they did free this whale, but um, the ropes around his face and head had gotten into the mouth. And uh, from the whale struggling and just swimming at thousands of miles, a thousand miles or so, it came down from Quebec to um, the southern end of the Gulf of Maine, um, pulled the baleen right up, yanked it right out of its mouth um, and out in the front through the um, top jaw and bottom jaw. And, um, and when they got the whale free, it did go off and, and join up with some other uh, right whales in the, in San Francisco, I mean, it's all in, um, yeah, where are we? <laughs> in, um, uh, Cape Cod Bay, and was then seen feeding. And eventually that um, baleen did work its way back into where it's supposed to be. For those of you who haven't looked in a whale's mouth, uh, baleen hangs down from the top jaws vertically. It's not supposed to be sticking out of the front of their mouth. So this whale did survive um, miraculously, making a long swim, hauling uh, hundreds of pounds of gear from the Gulf of St. Lawrence down the coast of uh, Quebec, um, Nova Scotia, and um, into the Gulf of Maine, and then down the coast of New England, the entire coast of, uh, of New England, uh, down into, um, and ironically, went straight to the guys who perfected uh, how, to, how to disentangle whales. Not like I knew that or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, David Matilla uh, now is in Maui, and he originally from um, Cape Cod and perfected a lot of that gear. And he's over there training people now in Maui and working disentangling whales. And what they're finding um, was that whales were coming into Maui uh, hauling gear, uh, crab gear from Alaska. You watch that show, The Deadliest Catch. Uh, David told me that's their deadliest catch. And um, they're coming in those huge traps that you see. Um, in that show being stacked on the boat. You know, they're hauling many of those and they're swimming from you know, Alaska right into the uh, Hawaiian Islands. And um, so how do you haul, a, how do you haul a crab gear to, to Hawaii? That's how you do it. Oh, wrong one, okay. And um, this photo here, Sarah might remember this. It was the first winter that we came out here to work here. So, on maybe the second winter, like 2017 or 18, um, got a um, text one day from Alisa Shulman Shanager, who had that photo of the whale over the uh, bow of that boat, um, saying that there's a, 
a whale coming. This is during the southbound, northbound migration where the gray whales were going back to the Arctic. There's a whale, she said, there's a whale caught up in some strange looking gear. It's wrapped around its head. And since you guys are so far north, the last sighting of it was in Santa Barbara. It went by UC Santa Barbara and was photographed. Um, we never did see it. We put an extra hours out on the, the bluffs there, but we never did see it. And I'm um, happy to say the whale did survive, but nobody knows how. Nobody saw what happened. But the, um, and nobody even knew what that thing was. And people who did see it say, how, how are you going to get that off that whale? You can't get on its back with a welding torch or some kind of a, a saw. And so the whale was never seen for quite a while. And then it was seen again and was photo identified without that gear. And someone familiar with that gear from the down around Mexico said that it was some kind of a, a fish, part of some kind of a fish trap that the whale managed to get its head in. So that was a happy ending, but um, it was pretty frightening to think about once the photographs went around, this whale was gonna probably not live and had that thing wrapped around its mouth and head right behind its nose, or right around its nose. And then uh, rope is fishing gear. Um, see, maybe Zach is watching. Um, Zach Clive is going to be getting a hold of um, uh, Wendy from Noyo here and to uh, see if um, Noyo will be interested in having a lecture um, about um, ropeless gear uh, with Rich um, yeah. Real. Yeah, Rich Real, who actually invented it. He's in Washington and did a fascinating talk on one of our, our Ocean Life Symposiums, and the last time that Sarah was involved with that. And um, it's always it's worked well. The only problem is um, getting uh, guys to um, trust it, and also some um, actually some major problems with it. Not problems with it, but just cost and uh, some logistical problems. But it works well. It's worked 100% of all tests on the East Coast that I know of. Um, just, just quickly, um, it eliminates the need for the buoys and eliminates the need for even a single rope going down to the first trap. So you have the um, um, trawl of traps, let's say just say eight or nine traps. Some are much, some trawls are much longer than that. And then on the first trap, there's a receiver of a, a, um, a signal that's sent from the lobster boat and the lobster is familiar with, most familiar with. And um, so the the um, owner of the boat, fisherman, has a um, coordinates of where it where he already dropped his his trawl, you know, without a buoy, and that's what makes them nervous. And who wouldn't be? Um, and this, uh, so they when they get over the coordinates, um, they push a button up in the um, pilot house of their boat, and that um, activates a. Uh, a transmitter which communicates with um, a, a receiver, which is in the first trap of the trawl. So you don't need one in every trap, just the first trap. And an, an inflatable um, buoy sort of opens up inside the trap and raises it to the surface, bringing all the other traps up with it. <clears throat> and uh, like I said, it's worked well. The big the uh, problem is. Um, you know, salt water on expensive gear like this. And um, another one is lobstermen not wanting to lay their gear over somebody else's gear because, you know, they don't know where everything is. But software is being developed now that that um, will help with that uh, considerably. And if Zach um, gets in touch with Wendy, she'll have very interesting um, uh, talk from Rich. Rich has underwater photography of that actually uh, working of the um, bladder inflating and the traps coming up to the surface. Okay, and then uh, sources of noise in the ocean, are pretty well aware of the seismic uh, wind farm development, ship noise, um, the echo sounders from boats and so forth, uh, pingers, uh, weather, and earthquakes. Uh, earthquakes are incredibly loud. A few years ago at a conference, I picked up some CDs from the like, Cornell University Lab of Ornithology that uh, Chris Clark and team had had um, had um, recorded, and there's this loud explosion on one, and it turned out that um, that was the sound of an earthquake going off underwater, 
and uh, no human explosion. It was just an earthquake uh, taking place in a deep ocean. So it was extremely loud. And every time I hear one near the coast here, when the whales are migrating, I wonder what that must do to them. Okay, and then um, the offshore platforms and um, windmills. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and um, the bride is going to start now. Okay. All right. I'll give you an update on the gray whale population. Uh, unfortunately, since uh, 2016, the population has declined by 46%. This is based on NOAA studies, um, and I'll show you the exact figures here in this slide. Uh, it was a high of close to 27,000 gray whales, and you could see how that's declined through the years. The latest estimate is down to 14,526, and this represents a decline of 46%. I took our data, I learned that NOAA gets this information from the southbound migration only, which is going on now. And I took, uh, we were beginning our 11th season of, of doing a gray whale census right here off our coast. So I compared it to our southbound counts and I, I came up with a decline of 41% here. So um, I wanna talk about the calves in 2016. There was roughly uh, 1,500 calves born. Uh, 2022 represented an all-time low of um, you know, just over 200. But the good news is in 223, they it did rebound to uh, over 400, 412. And these surveys are done um, by that same team who counts the southbound migration. They go out again to count the uh, mothers and calves off Piedras Blancas it's, um, in, in central California. Um, oops, now I have to do this. Um, Arctic sea levels are definitely linked with the gray whale mass die-off events. A paper was just produced um, in October of 2023, uh, stating that there is a definite link between the Arctic sea ice levels and what we see happening to the gray whales. Over the past five years, since 2019, a total of 690 stranded gray whales have been recorded. And because of the long migration that they do, this involves three countries, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Uh, now, remember, 690 is what have been seen and counted. Most whales, when they die, they do sink to the bottom of the seafloor. So it, this could mean that close to 7,000 gray whales have died in, during this uh, UME, or unusual mortality event. Uh, warming temperatures have, have, have led to the melting of the ice cover. This means less algae that grows on the underside of sea ice, and that feeds the benthic amphipods upon which gray whales feed. So less algae, fewer amphipods, less food for the gray whales. Many of them are emaciated. They're malnourished. They don't have enough fuel to make that incredibly long migration. Here's a picture, uh, oh, little uh, video with the lead author of that study, Dr. Josh Stewart. Scientists call it an unusual mortality event. In 2019, gray whales started dying off the Pacific coast at alarming rates. But for years, experts couldn't do much more than guess as to why. That is, until now. Feels like this time we've got a pretty good smoking gun. And That's Josh Stewart, a professor at Oregon State's Marine Mammal Institute. In research published Thursday, he's found the first definitive evidence of what's been killing the whales. Yeah, I think we can now say much more conclusively that it probably is, you know, Arctic conditions that are driving these things. Gray whales migrate more than 12,000 miles each year, spending their winters in Mexico, where they give birth to calves, and heading north in the summer to the rich feeding grounds in the Arctic. And Stewart said that's where the problems began. And so there's this really tight connection between the sea ice and the prey base for the gray whales. Gray whales feed on tiny organisms called benthic amphipods. 
Those amphipods, they feed on algae that grows on the underside of sea ice. With climate change warming the Arctic up to four times faster than the rest of the planet, that meant trouble from the bottom of the food chain all the way up to the top. And so when you have less sea ice and fewer days of sea ice, um, you don't get that algae reaching the seafloor to sort of uh, create that productivity that the gray whales need. Less sea ice makes for skinnier whales, lower birth rates, and malnourished animals washing up on beaches. It's reducing the amount of food that they have available to them and disrupting that whole food chain that they rely on. But it's not all doom and gloom. They're resilient animals. You know, they, they're adaptive. Uh, they can change the areas that they feed in. So, you know, I'm not worried about them going extinct. Though with climate change expected to continue warming the Arctic in the years and decades to come, Stewart said we might have to get used to seeing fewer whales off our coast. We're going to be increasingly, I think, living in a world where we're going to have to deal with these impacts that are hard to reverse and have really significant effects on species that we care a lot about. And that's a hard thing to stomach. Kale Williams, KGW News. Scientists call it an unusual. Here's that picture of um, a whale taken, the gray whales taken from, gro uh, from drones. And you could see uh, throughout the years how thin and they have become, uh, making it really hard to survive. Moving on to some plastics, um, I think it was last month, Sue Coulter did a wonderful presentation about plastics. So some of this will be a repeat, but here's a blue whale showing that 10 million pieces of microplastics uh, can be you know, found uh, per day. And that is a pretty alarming amount. Um, here are those little zooplankton that uh, they remember, uh, Scott said, they're only about the size of a grain of rice. And you can see that within their little bodies, they're, the fluorescent, the bright green are microplastics of various sizes inside of them. And this is what uh, you know, so many other marine animals are consuming. So you can see how this is being passed on through the food web, and it's very dangerous. Um, uh, there is um, a project called the Ocean Cleanup. It is started by a young man. He's now 29, Boyan Slat. Um, he, at the age of 16, he and his family went to Greece where he did some scuba diving. And much to his dismay, what he saw in the water was more plastic than fish. And this really motivated, this disturbed him and motivated him to want to do something, to clean up the ocean. And he followed through with this, uh, these ideas and created this incredible project called the Ocean uh, Cleanup. So he's targeted not only the ocean, but the source of a lot of the plastic reaching the ocean, of course, are rivers. He, his research shows that there are a thousand rivers worldwide that contribute to 80% of the plastic that ends up in the ocean. And it's a fascinating system. It's a cat, it's literally catching the plastic in these nets and hauling it onto the ship. Uh, it, it's amazing. I'm going to show you how it works right now with a video. here in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch with our latest system, System 3, also known as Josh. And Josh is basically a 2.2 kilometer big floating barrier. And the biggest part of this system is made up by two wings of so four meters deep that skim the ocean surface for floating plastics. And those plastics, they float along the wing to a central area, which we call the retention zone. And the retention zone is basically a big garbage bag where all the plastics are collected. And this system is being towed through the ocean by two vessels, like the one I'm on now. And they tow this system with a very low speed, 1.5 knots or a little bit less than three kilometers an hour. So it's slower than you would walk. So we always see a lot of fish swimming in the system and swimming back out. And in this retention zone, we also have a lot of cameras so we can see what's going on. 
we always try to find the spots here in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch with the highest plastic density, and we call those hot spots. We have uh, computational modelers, they look at waves and current, and they are getting better and better at predicting where in this fast ocean the plastic density will be the highest. And after we've been out here for three or four days and have been collecting plastics, our garbage bag is getting full. So then we are going to do an extraction. And whenever we do an extraction, one of the two vessels towing the system is taking both wings on board so that the other vessel is free to go to the rear and it will then tie off the garbage bag and pull it on deck. We open it up and we dump all the plastics that we found on the deck. And after the extraction, we are sorting the plastics for different types of, of waste according to their different recycle streams. And we put the system back in the water and we continue towing for plastics. And I'd just like to end with this quote. Um, and I know Sue Coulter would like this because she is an incredible educator. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. What a beautiful presentation, Scott and Tree. Thank you so much. Thank I you. can really put a lot of work into bringing all of that information to us and um, we're tremendously grateful. We appreciate you all. Thank you and good night. <laughs>